Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to be talking about the electron microscope. Now in, in microscopy lessons in school you're most likely going to be using the light or optical microscope because the electron microscope, as you can see from the top picture on the right hand side, the electron microscope is significantly bigger. It's a bit more cumbersome and it's significantly more expensive too. So what we're going to do, we'll talk about the electron microscope in terms of how it works and a bit about its structure. And then I'll go on to talk about the two types of electron microscope we've got. The TEM, or transmission electron microscope, and the SEM, the scanning electron microscope. Now here's the fundamental difference between the two. In a light microscope, what we would have is a light source. So this would be a light source. And ultimately, we would have light rays that pass from that light source all the way to, essentially, the human eye. But what we have with the electron microscope instead is an electron source. So we'll just draw a little circle there to represent our electron source. But this time, instead of having the eye as the receiver, if you like, instead what we have is quite simply just a fluorescent screen. Now let's think about why those this is going to be different. The electron microscope, unlike the light or optical microscope, uses a beam of electrons instead of light, produced by an electron gun to be able to get the image. In fact, the electron microscope has not just the electron um, source, but it consists of a number of magnetic condensers and magnetic projectors to be able to direct that electron beam onto the fluorescent screen. See, whereas an object or optical or light microscope would have more things like a condenser lens or an object objective and eyepiece lens. So the electron microscope uses a beam of electrons produced by an electron gun instead of a beam of light. And electron beams have wavelengths much shorter than the wavelengths of visible light. So an electron microscope has what's called a much greater resolving power than a light microscope. Now resolving power refers to the ability to distinguish two points that are close to that appear to be close together as separate. So the greater the resolving power, the greater the points can be and still be distinguished as separate. So let's make a few, I think a few notes on the bottom about the electron microscope. So the first key thing that I said was using a beam of electrons. And then I said that those electron beams of a shorter wavelength compared to light rays and therefore it has a greater so the increased so the two hours for increased what's called resolving power and that's fairly obvious because of this picture got on the right here what we've got here is a picture taken with an electron microscope of the the glomerulus or, or what this is a singular glomerulum in a mouse kidney so the first part of the kidney in the nephron we have the glomerulus sitting in um, the bowman's capsule and that's where you get what's called ultrafiltration so this is a high powered um, electron microscope image of a glomerulum now with an optical microscope you would never be able to see this detail not not at all, this would be too small. But in this, as it's called an electron micrograph, you are able to see that. Now the need for thinness and a vacuum place great limitations on what can be viewed using electron microscopes. So let's just explain a bit more about, about that. The sample that you use has to be thin. For the, for the images to be 
um, produce the sample you use, the specimen must be very, very thin. And so that the electron beam is able to be focused from the electron source to that fluorescent screen that I've just drawn in the diagram, you would need there to be no particles that that electron would interact with. So you can't have any air. So there needs to be a complete vacuum, an absence of any matter at all. So because of that, you cannot use living material. You can only use dead structures essentially. So that's one key thing to make a note of with the electron microscope that because you have to use a vacuum this would only be able to be used with non-living material. And it's fairly obvious, it's just to make the point, you, these electrons can't be seen as such. So that's why they're focused onto this fluorescent screen, which emits visible light when electrons hit it. And the screen can be photographed to give what I, I called an electron micrograph. So that's how we produce one of those images. So let's talk about the two types. Because I said we have what's called the scanning and the transmission electron microscope. So I'll put here number one is the scanning and just in another colour, number two the transmission. So let's talk about the scanning one first. The scanning electron microscope is basically similar to the transmission one but here the electrons are bounced off the prepared surface of the specimen. The, the beam of electrons it uses is passed back and forth across the surface in a regular pattern. So it's bouncing off that surface, that's why we use the word scanning, if you like, it's scanning that surface. And the scattering of the electrons depends on the sort of topology like of the specimen surface, depends on what the surface is like, how bumpy it is, if, if you can imagine it like that. Computer analysis of the pattern of the scattered electrons can build up a 3D image. So you can get a 3D image with a scanning electron microscope. The resolving power of a scanning electron microscope is about 20 nanometers. Now that's still 10 times better than an optical microscope. Just to say that the magnification, just to put that into a relevant um, context as well. The magnification of an electron microscope can be up to about 500,000. So we're, we're talking very significant levels of magnification here. Now I said that the resolving power of ESEM uh, scanning electron microscope is about 20 nanometers. The light microscope has a resolving power of about 200 nanometers. So you can see it's still very very small but, it, it, but it's much larger than the SEM. The SEM is able to resolve the images to distinct points as separate to a better degree. Now, there are some, oh, some limitations of the scanning electron microscope. In fact, they're very similar to the transmission one, except the specimens here don't have to be very thin. The scanning electron microscope, because we're looking primarily at the surface, it doesn't matter if the specimen is a little bit thicker. So that's what you need to know in the exam about scanning. Let's talk about transmission electron microscope. The transmission electron microscope passed through a very thin section of the specimen on the way to the fluorescent screen. So what we'll actually do is I'll reduce the screen and just make a few, a few notes here about the two points I've raised. So I'll bring this down, in fact we'll move this up and I'll put it over to the corner. I think just before I continue talking, I think I'll make a few points about the scanning one. So I said that they're, the electrons are bounced off the surface. That's one key thing to note. We get a 3D image. Resolving power, we'll make a note of that, the resolving Power. We're looking at values of about 20 nanometers. As I said, the specimen doesn't 
need to be thin. But there, are specimens we know what we're referring to. Let's think about the transmission electron microscope for a moment. The transmission electron microscope, I said, passed through a thin section of the specimen. So we'll make a note here. You need a thin specimen. Now, parts of the specimen actually absorb electrons and they appear dark. Other parts of the specimen allow electrons to just pass through them or transmit through them. So they actually appear bright. The resolving power of a transmission electron microscope is actually 0.1 nanometers, significantly smaller. So it's quite a powerful piece of equipment. So we'll make a note of that as well. So resolving power this time is about 0.1 nanometers. Now let's think about some of the limitations here because the TEM is significantly limited. There are complex staining processes involved using heavy metal ions such as lead and osmium. Now they are taken up by particular parts of a cell and appear dark. So we can make a note of that, that the actual staining process of the specimen is quite complex. Now I said the SEM produces 3D images. The images that you get from a transmission electron microscope are actually flat and in 2D and they're only in black and white. So the staining process is complex. I'll put here that the image is 2D and I'll put flat images there. Now I've said that the specimen needs to be really thin but one of the key things to remember is that the image that you get from a TEM may contain what's called artifacts due to the complex staining techniques so it's difficult to be sure that what is seen on the micrograph really exists. Now artifacts are essentially contaminants so that's one of the big drawbacks of the transmission electron microscope and I'll put that in a slightly different colour just nearby because I don't think we've got enough room there. I'll just put the word artefacts as a reminder for you. So there's a little bit about the two types of electron microscope that we've got, the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. Ultimately, this is a piece of equipment that uses electron source and electron beam as opposed to light in an optical microscope to produce an image focused on a fluorescent screen. The reason why electrons are used is because they have a shorter wavelength than light and a greater resolving power and we can magnify to a much greater extent as shown by the picture on the right hand side of the screen. Key thing to remember here when you're looking at electron microscope or talking about it in exams is that you need the vacuum. You need to have no air within that whole the body of the equipment. So there must be no matter for those electrons to interfere with. So you could only use non-living material. And that applies to both the transmission and scanning electron microscope. Okay, hope all of that helps.